get started then. So um, my name is Carolyn Cadman and I'm Chief Exec of Cornwall Wildlife Trust and also Chief Exec of our recording. which is Cornwall Wildlife Trust. Um, now, I, I suppose we should go through a little bit of etiquette, which is if you're if you're here and, and involved in the masterclass, it'd be great if you could um, put yourself on mute. Otherwise, we get all sorts of strange noises and dogs barking and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but um, yeah, I think we can use the chat for questions. And if you have something you want to ask me, I can't and I can't necessarily see you in the chat. Then do do just put your microphone on and, and ask me a question. Um, so, Cornwall Wildlife Trust is one of 46 wildlife trusts across the country. Um, we have about 17,000 members here in Cornwall, but across the whole country there are around 850,000 members of, of wildlife trusts, which is um, close to the million uh, members that RSPB have, and I think it's 1.5 million that, that the National Trust have, so we, we are a membership organisation. And one of the main things that we do is manage land. Um, so on the right hand side of that screen, you can see the 57 nature reserves that Cornwall Wildlife Trust has across Cornwall at the moment, and we have plans for more, which I'll tell you about later. Um, so I know there will be some people on the, on the Zoom here who who aren't in Cornwall. Um, so I thought I'd better just check you into where, where Cornwall is geographically in the country. So picture on the left, the red bit, that's where Cornwall is, right out on the western tip, southwestern tip of, of the UK. Um, and it's principally a maritime uh, location. You could think of it as, a, as an island. In fact, we, we often do because we obviously have got a lot of sea around us. And it's typically thought of as a tourist destination um, with a very rural economy, um, fishing and farming. However, that is changing, as many of you will have heard today from the different examples and case studies that are coming through, through um, clean tech, green renewables, creative industry in particular. Um, but we do still have um, issues in terms of social justice and inclusion. And again, you've heard about that this morning from other colleagues. Um, so it's one of the more beautiful parts of the country and these are some stunning scenes um, from across Cornwall. I won't run through all of them, but suffice to say bottom right Cornish chuff, that's one of our more distinctive species and we're all happy that around 28, after a gap of around 28 years, the Cornish chuff came back after conservation efforts were put forward to bring back their habitat. So we built Rome and the, the chuff followed back to Rome or Cornwall as we say. Um, on this slide, you can see top left, you can see the resident pod of bottlenose dolphins that Cornwall has. They swim north south coast and they live in Cornwall all year round, which is awesome. Um, and you can see that we have globally rare species on our doorsteps as well. We can go out and we can go, almost guarantee that we'll see grey seals bottom right, um, which is amazing, absolutely brilliant. However, nature is in decline in Cornwall and um, if if any of you have been um, following me on social media or Cornwall Wildlife Trust um, over the last few days you might have seen some of the headlines and the detailed findings of the State of Nature report which we State of Nature Cornwall report which we published this week in full. Um, we were inspired by a report that was done in 2019 which confirmed that 41% um, of species in the UK are in decline. And so we wanted to find out what that meant for Cornwall. And what we found was pretty grim actually, was you know headlines like three fifths of butterflies are found in fewer places, nearly half of breeding birds have declined and nearly half of terrestrial mammals are found in fewer places. Um, and there's lots more bad news in that report, but equally, there's lots of good news as well, and there's hope and optimism because lots of people out there, lots of community groups, and of course, lots of businesses are doing something about the fact that nature's in decline and you're putting nature front and center of your decision-making. And so on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see some of the good things that are happening, volunteers uh, collecting plastic, um, people valuing nature much more now than they did before. COVID happened as well. And bottom left of that slide, if you want to download the full State of Nature Cornwall report, which I would recommend because there's lots of good case studies in there, go onto our website and have a look. 
So Cornwall Wildlife Trust, this, this is what we're aiming to achieve over the next 10 years. We want, um, like many others, like you heard Kate Canally talk about earlier and, and George Eustace, Secretary of State as well, we want at least 30% of land, rivers and seas being managed well for wildlife. And at the moment, we're managing 0.66% of Cornwall uh, in terms of those nature reserves, but we want to influence more land in Cornwall to be managed well for wildlife. And that's where biodiversity net gain comes in, which we'll come on to in a second. We also want uh, wilder people. So we want one in four people taking action for nature. And that's not just um, us in our everyday lives as, as residents of Cornwall or, or visitors to Cornwall. It's also businesses, it's, it's leaders, it's, it's the bigger decisions that ha can have a bigger impact. So there's, a, there's a, a, an advocacy and engagement um, angle that, that the Wildlife Trust is taking in education as well. And then thirdly, of course, we want to reverse the decline of nature. We want a wilder future for our children and grandchildren. So, so those are the three, three main things that Cornwall Wildlife Trust is aiming to achieve. Um, we also know, don't we, that nature is good for business, and it must be because so many companies have nature as part of their logo um, or use nature in their branding and the way they communicate what it is they do. So some of these companies on the screen in front of you um, depend on the environment for their for their uh, for their trade, but some don't. Some simply use nature in their branding because they know that it's attractive, that it appeals to people. So we know from experience and from working with the Cornwall Chamber of Commerce for a long time, when we've held wild business um, networking events, we know that nature is good for business. Um, and we also know that nature is good for helping to tackle the um, challenges that um, society faces. So. Tree cover, for example, if you're in a wooded area, you gen that, that area is going to be 10% cooler than if you're out in the sunshine. So canopy cover is good for temperature regulation, but it's also good for mitigating um, skin damage and skin cancer as well. So trees can be a nature-based solution for keeping cool and for, for protecting us against um, skin cancer. Um, so there's, there's the, the habitat benefits, but there's also animal benefits as well. And on the right-hand side of the screen there, you can see um, one of the beavers down at Woodland Valley Farm, which is part of the Cornwall Beaver Project, a partnership between Cornwall Wildlife Trust and the Beaver Project, Beaver Trust, sorry. Um, and those beavers have been hard at work for the last three years, um, creating new habitats. They, they eat wood, so they're chopping down trees and their actions help to create pools, which they live in. And it also helps to create new habitat for new species, attracting more insects, which in turn attracts more birds. And, and the, the main impact that the beavers have on, on, on habitat is that it starts to create these pools which um, gather rainwater and slows the flow of water through a catchment, which has much more benefits for natural flood management. So um, we're working, currently working with the Environment Agency and others to look at um, more beaver reintroductions in Cornwall and across the country. So that's a whistle stop tour um, in an introduction into Cornwall Wildlife Trust. Um, and we have a consultancy, as I mentioned earlier, called Cornwall Environmental Consultants. Um, and the consultancy um, traditionally delivers two main services. One, one is e ecology surveys. Um, so if you're, you're doing a piece of work or a development, you need to understand the baseline. Um, of the ecology and biodiversity that you have on site, first of all. Um, the, the environmental consultants can come and come and do that assessment for you. Um, and we also deliver landscape and tree services as well. So if you need a, a landscape um, and visual impact assessment, uh, LBIA, um, the consultancy can, can deliver those services too. And we're looking at new services as well in light of um, carbon markets that are emerging. Two. And one of those new services is around biodiversity net gain. So today I'm going to give you an overview of biodiversity net gain and explain how it came about, why it's important, and run over some of the, the principles that, that, that basically frame the biodiversity net gain scheme. So the, the principle behind biodiversity net gain is that it's development that leaves biodiversity in a measurably better state than before that development has happened. And note the word measurably. So how do you measure biodiversity? Do you physically count each beetle or bee or bird, every blade of grass, every flower? Um, no, you don't. There's a, there's a DEFRA 
um, DEFRA produced biodiversity metric that, that has been developed to help with this um, task of, of measuring biodiversity. It's quite a clever piece of work um, and it's been developed um, through 10 years of pilots in the UK, which uses habitat as a proxy for biodiversity. So in a on a general level, we're moving from a situation where conservation is mitigation um, to a situation where biodiversity is actually improved as a result of the development process. Move on to the next slide. So you might not be able to see the words in the middle of the screen now. I don't know if anyone has size it possible. Um, so biodiversity net gain has been a requirement of the national planning policy framework since it was introduced in 2012. Um, and following a consultation, DEFRA launched a biodiversity metric in 2019 as the approved tool for calculating biodiversity net gain. And the amount of biodiversity net gain that needs to be achieved was set at 10%. So all developments would have to achieve a 10% increase net gain in, in biodiversity. Um, Cornwall Council, however, um, were ahead of the game. Uh, they introduced biodiversity net gain, um, I think it was March last year, ahead of the Environment Bill, which will mandate um, biodiversity net gain across the rest of the country. So Cornwall, again, is leading the way in introducing biodiversity net gain. So how does it work? Um, so as already mentioned, biodiversity net gain that needs to be delivered for each development is 10%. Um, at the moment, it's only required for major developments, so that's um, typically 10 houses or more. But the next point is quite, is quite important. So it stresses that wherever possible, the 10% biodiversity net gain needs to be achieved within the development site. And that has implications really for thinking about the site that you're developing. Um, and the, the site selection and what's achievable in the terms of the density of the development within that site. Um, the biodiversity net gain metric, I'm going to call biodiversity net gain BNG from now on because it's a bit of a mouthful to have to keep saying. So the BNG metric um, has to be completed by a suitably qualified ecologist. So someone probably who's uh, accredited by SAI, the Chartered Institute of um, uh, Ecologists and Environmental Management. Um, so you need a professional ecologist to, to, to do this metric for you and ideally you would involve them from the outset so as soon as you've identified the site you would engage with an ecologist so they can help advise you on how to achieve BNG from the outset. Another key point to take into consideration is that the requirement includes a commitment on the part of the developer to maintain and monitor the habitats on site for at least 30 years. Um, and that commitment will usually be secured by the local planning authority through a planning condition. And for most projects and developments, the local planning authority would want to see a maintenance and monitoring plan, which explains how the habitats will be maintained, managed and monitored, and how this would be secured in terms of funding. Um, so that's, that's quite an important aspect of um, the developments that are happening in Cornwall. If there are over 10 house, houses before the environment bill is mandated, they'll have to um, provide this, this information up front in the planning application. Um, so but, uh, that sounds like a quite a burden, I guess, what I've just described. You have to employ an ecologist, you have to do something for 30 years and, and show how you're gonna manage and maintain it. So what are the actual ben benefits for developers of biodiversity net gain? Um, and there are, we think there are a number of um, benefits. Firstly, reputational benefit. Uh, you will have, if you've achieved BNG on the site in a meaningful way, maybe you've overachieved the 10%, you can really shout about that and use, use that in your advertising and in, your, in, in the way that you show you're doing the right thing for Cornwall and for uh, future generations. Um, secondly, achieving BNG also helps with planning certainty. It's a clear demonstration that you've met the policy requirements and could help to ease the process of a planning application. Thirdly, it's quantified. So up until now, ecologists have had to make professional judgments as to whether developments meet the um, requirements of the national planning policy framework in order to enhance biodiversity. But now there's actually a robust set of calculations to back up those judgments, i.e. the DEFRA metric. Um, it's also quantified. So, so because you were able to demonstrate to the, from the advice of the ecologist that you're going to deliver X percent biodiversity net gain, 
um, you can gain trust from stakeholders that, that biodiversity will actually be enhanced because a professional has advised you. Every developer has to achieve the same target. So it's, it's creating a level playing field um, across developers so that everyone has to do it. And then finally, the requirement we think will encourage innovation as, as developers think differently about how they can engage with nature, engage with wildlife, engage with biodiversity on their site, and really start to think about new ways of, of bringing nature and rewarding design teams that do, do things well and creating habitat. So, wider benefits. Um, obviously, by creating new habitat, you'll be bringing more benefits to society as a whole because a healthy biodiversity and ecosystems provide other natural services, like I was saying earlier about canopy cover from trees being good for temperature and, and skin cancer, for example. So the other benefits that, that delivering the biodiversity net gain will help to deliver for, for Cornwall is providing um, food, water and fuel. Uh, regulating natural processes which are essential to our survival, climate control, flooding, controlling pests and disease, clean water and pollution, sorry, pollination even, um, providing processes which support us like nutrient cycling and production of oxygen and providing us with services that are important for our culture and well-being, green spaces for recreation and education. So let's go into a bit more detail about what it actually involves and how the um, biodiversity net gain is calculated and worked out. Um, your ecologist will measure the biodiversity value of the site as it is prior to development, which is based on the habitat types present. The ecological conditions of these habitats and other factors such as habitat connectivity and the context of the site in terms of strategic nature recovery objectives. But, the ecologist will then use the scheme design information to predict what the biodiversity value of the site is um, and what the biodiversity value will be after development based on the same factors and additional factors that take into account things like how difficult it is to create particular habitats and how long they would take to reach the predicted habitat condition. It's important to remember that BNG is not all about the calculations. I mean, yes, they are important and they form the basis of the requirement, but there are also principles that need to be followed. Um, for example, following the mitigation hierarchy. So aiming to retain and enhance existing habitats on site rather than treating a site as if it's a blank canvas and just creating all new habitats on site. So that's the mitigation hierarchy in the orange, orange green triangle on screen. So here are the some scenarios. Um, scenario A is always the preferred option. And this is where the developer is able to um, avoid harm to biodiversity and is able to um, enhance on the site. Scenario B is a situation where the developer can't achieve BNG on site, but they can secure the biodiversity 10% gain off site, perhaps by buying an additional piece of land or making another bit of land or using another bit of land nearby that they own and arranging for habitat enhancement and creation to be undertaken on that, that land. Or scenario C, um, where the developer can't achieve the, uh, the net gain on site and doesn't have any way of providing the, um, the off-site provision. So in that situation, they'd go to a third party which could be a local planning authority or a private offset provider and you pay a tariff by the developer to, to fund habitat creation and enhancement projects. So that's where you, that's how you would achieve it if you couldn't achieve it on site. And unsurprisingly, Cornwall Wildlife Trust are offering biodiversity offsetting to as a pri private provider, and we have several sites ready to go. So that's that's a bit of information on the screen about how you achieve BNG. I think I've got about a minute left, so I'm just going to skip through some of these um, slides. This is an example of um, a biodiversity net gain site that, that we have, um, from Wildlife Trust has, and any developers on the call who want to have a chat with us about um, achieving biodiversity net gain, do get in touch with us. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see that we've got some heavily grazed low diversity grassland, and on the right-hand side, through um, offset payments, 
um, we have invested in that land and we've improved its biodiversity and habitat condition um, and developers are now uh, uh, able to buy biodiversity credits from us. So there's our contact information, <coughs> commonwildlifetrust.org.uk and cecenvironment.org.uk. Um, we, as a wildlife trust, we also offer um, bespoke support packages for businesses where you can become a business member or project sponsor, a wildlife guardian, you can sponsor a nature reserve. There's lots of ways in which we work with different businesses. I'm sorry for the hard sell, I have to do that, that's my job. Um, so I think we might have time for a couple of questions. I'm sorry I rushed to the end of that, but does anyone want to ask anything whilst we have time? No, I can I can only see Niran and, and Bob. So and they're both shaking their heads. Oh, there's a chat, there's the chat. Let's have a look. Has anyone? Who do we contact? This is Vicky to everyone. Who do we contact if you want advice on enhancing biodiversity in our woodland? Well, you can contact Cornwall Environmental Consultants. Um, and you can also go online and um, look at Cornwall Wildlife Trust website. There's some, there's some information on there as well. Have a look this up. Paula, what will be done to enforce BNG? I live on a new housing estate where a planning breach occurred and Cornish Hedge Root Town not reinstated. Despite formal complaints to Cornwall Council, planning and engaging MPs, how can we be confident developers will be held to account? That's a really good question, Paula. Um, and that's uh, obviously important is the responsibility of Cornwall Council. And I think it's important for everyone, um, if you care about Cornwall, to make sure that Cornwall Council and your, and your councillor is ensuring that, that um, the council is doing their job effectively in terms of both setting policy but also regulating um, planning policy as well. And we know that um, from the environmental growth strategy, we know that 65% of um, planning conditions, environmental planning conditions that are, um, that are, that are, that are given as part of the planning application, only 65% of the environmental benefits are actually delivered, 35% aren't. And that, that's quite a shocking um, piece of information from the environmental growth strategy that Cornwall Council themselves have, have publicly um, presented. So yeah, we need all, all eyes on, on um, Cornwall Council to make sure they're doing the right, right thing in a supportive, obviously, way. Um, let's have a look at another question from Vicky. This is an exciting and welcome concept if it gets enforced by Cornwall Council to be on site, not just a gesture made by the developer elsewhere. I think I can see people nodding to that. Do you think this is from Sarah Moss. Do you think biodiversity net gain goes far enough, given the quote below from the Dasgupta review? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. Is 10% enough? Well, in my role as Chief Executive of Cornwall Wildlife Trust, 10% isn't enough, is it? 10% is, is not very much, really. So um, I think we can strive to have a higher target. <coughs> um, Let's oh. something else has just appeared on my screen. Here we go. It's the offset that is a get out for developers. Well, yes, um, that's an interesting point as well. I mean, is, is this just a scheme to pay where developers who can afford it can pay to destroy the environment? That's one one view that came about when this when carbon offsetting was, was in the news a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the planning authority's decision as to whether a development can go ahead or not. Um, and if a pot of money is generated to support biodiversity, um, both Cornwall Wildlife Trust and Cornwall Environmental Consultants want to make sure that that money is allocated and spent in absolutely the right way for Cornwall's wildlife. So that's, that's, our, that's our position on, on things like this. Um, 